should work. And let's see. Let's put this on hidden for right now. Tutor, oh no, where is it at? Video capture. There we go. All right, cool. Makes it a little bit easier. Let's go classroom time for now until we need to switch over. And this is still doing right. Cool. And let me just check how the stream sounds. That's perfect, that's not too bad. That's perfect, that's not too bad. Sweet. Alright. So that should be good. I might turn my mic down just a wee bit. But. Let's see. I might move this, maybe less the screen. I don't need to see these side pictures. Let's see if I can run this. Let's see how am I gonna how am I gonna output that? I already have my capture card in there. So I really can't do that. What about that other weird program? Glide or whatever it's called. Is it? Hey, what's up, Maps? I would say long time no see, but it actually wasn't that long ago that we actually got to meet. <laughs> so good on ya. How's, uh, how's it been going? 
Oh, also, this is probably the first time you've actually seen all this since the last time we met. I was mainly just the mitts and everything, so. Welcome. <laughs> well, actually, I guess, uh, unless only only if you've been on YouTube. I saw that you subscribed over there or something like that, so you would have seen what I looked like eventually. <laughs> you know, there's a big difference between us and Turkey. And, you know, thank you. Hey, thank you. It, uh, somehow got super lucky because, man, I was just terrible when I was a teenager and everything, so somehow karma probably helped out a lot. <laughs> Um, later on, just being a good person probably got to me eventually because I was terrible when I was young. <laughs> uh, what are the, let's see. I have a couple, and it's kind of different the, the way that I have this stream kind of going. Uh, what was it called? I have a couple of my um, older students potentially, at least one, but a couple maybe, uh, that are going to be taking their examinations uh, in the next couple of days so that they can become licensed or registered for being a dental assistant. So uh, one of the things that they wanted me to do is to help them kind of study. And that's why I kind of have that thing. It's just a little study time if they wanted to show up and uh, ask questions, just kind of like how everyone of you that can randomly do it also can. Their questions might be a little bit more geared towards, um, like, hardcore small dental things, but hopefully, um, hopefully it's not too late for them to join up and join along and everything. Um, but cool. Yeah, you said it's a big time difference between us and Turkey. Uh, let's see, if I can guess without looking into, like, Google, I'm pretty sure, um... What is it like an 11 hour difference probably? So it's 10 o'clock. It's about to be 10 for myself So for all of you and this is a complete different guess. What is it like 7 o'clock? Like 7.52? That's it's probably a terrible guess. It's probably 8.52 or so All right, so that looks like it's working well, and hopefully, see I got two people over here, so that's cool, and then someone just joined in over on the other side, and let's see if that's my old pal. Uh, where is this at? Oh, why am I defocusing? Do I have autofocuses on? Good. Yeah, it was just a weird, weird little offshoot right there. Cool. Uh, but, let me see. I can go and switch over from this to class with screen that I made. And if I go and pull up something like, uh, where's that browser window? see if it'll actually work. Looks like it's not doing it yet. Video capture device is over there. Oh, you're all good. <laughs> no, I don't want it to be that. Cancel. Oh, I need to switch this, that's why. 
No, not that. Seven. Oh, the... Oh, you must have, like, caught it with, uh, you must have caught, um, I think probably yesterday's stream or something like that when I was, uh, trying to set it up or something then. That's what it was, yeah, because I think, what the hell was I doing yesterday? What, 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 when the hell was I doing yesterday? Because I was at, I was at the bench. Oh, I was trying to work on uh, the, my ring. That's what I was doing. That's right. Um, not specifically a Steam Deck, but I think it's like one of the competitors. It's called an Ally. And I picked it up last week. Or was it this week? I, you know, I picked it up on this week on Monday and trying it out. Yes, as was Windows 11, and I'm kind of getting used to it, but... For the most part, it does exactly what I need to do for Windows um, as far as installing anything that I need it to install. So thankfully it hasn't been failing me like that, but I mean, it's a trip. It's, uh, it, it is cool. I've been waiting to try to get a handheld thing like that for a good while and that piled off because they're so damn expensive, but um, I finally was able to save up enough to make the purchase and it's been cool so far i i haven't really had a lot of time to try it out but it being nearby gives me a reason to just kind of at lunchtime get it in my hands play a couple things of uh play 20 minutes of something and then i can just throw it away and go back into whatever i was trying to do so it's been it's been pretty sweet i enjoy it my kids like it too. Every now and then they'll be like, can I play th this game, Paw Patrol? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I have it on there. Let's go ahead and do it. And especially since they, especially since that one being five years old, six years old, uh, five years old, um, them getting used to holding the controls and knowing what to do with the buttons, I'm being very impressed that she is grasping onto that concept because not that long ago they, she did not know it was, it was all touch screens and tablet but her being able to use like a controller and everything and buttons and a joystick is um making me want her to play um other games with me so that's going to be a, a fun thing eventually that i can have her be my backup and be like save your dad please revive me and uh so that'll be a fun thing in the future um i hope we can all always hope but uh, yeah, I'm just trying to, I think I got, for the most part, set up. I got a good amount of games. I'm mainly playing Final Fantasy games at the moment, uh, which um, is definitely bringing joy to my heart again. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a fun toy. I like it. I, hopefully I can take care of it. I need to get a, I need to get a case for it so that I can, uh, I can carry it around a little bit more safely. But um, super fun. Super fun. And eventually, if I can, I'm going to try to get it hooked up so I can do my stream on this and kind of get things I want done. What up, Ben? How have you been? Shoot. I'm really sorry, but I need to go because it's 8 a.m. There he is. 8. That's right. I need to go to school. I just want to say, oh, yeah, you're good, Maps. Definitely. It was nice uh, hearing back from you, too. So have good studies and everything. Enjoy school. I know you're in a super smart people school so you keep it you keep it going yeah ben test day tomorrow super exciting bye <laughs> um yeah well, let me let me go and throw my i want to why the hell is this not working like i want it to maybe i need to bring it up here okay let me let me go and xna the browser yeah ben because it's you then I believe after you is going to be another one of your coworkers. That's going to take it the next day. And then even after that, the day after, is going to be another person, another one of the my previous students that's going to take it on 
Friday. So I'm like, oh, if Ben's going to join me, then if uh, we already let that person's family member know because we work with them to, hey, go on, go and check up with Miller to see if you can join in on study time. And then she even sent that to another person. No way. Oh, that's so going to be cool for him. Yeah, he came recently. He showed up at class, I think it was orientation the other day. And I was like, hey, what's up? So that's cool that it's going to be not too long that we're going to have just a flood of all of you getting into gear. So that's going to be awesome. Super cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it just like kind of how you even mentioned about if we can have just... Or if I can somehow just get like a test prep ses session going, uh, that it would be pretty cool to um, it'd be pretty cool to be able to offer this and maybe it starts steamrolling to throughout California and everything. So uh, this is kind of our test version to try to get it going. So hopefully we can make it. Hopefully we can make it count. Um, What's it called? Let me go and try to get this going before we get too far. Where'd it go? Cancel. That. Took the practice exam in the book. 88%. Guess I passed. Definitely cool. Um, I have another... Um, I have another... Um, one that I'm gonna want you to do here and I may have gotten you to do it before when it comes to this version and exam start over but um, this one's similar ish when it comes to it uh, or at least it should should damn well be when it comes to uh, this exam, let me just, I just want to get it all framed up right, so just a second. And I may have taught you guys to, like, go and do this one before in the past, but, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. There we go. Cool. This is actually not the easiest to read. There we go. That could help a little bit. Um, cool. But, um, definitely, um, I'm not sure if I taught you uh, or showed you all to use uh, another version, which is called Evolve. Uh, that's kind of the way that we went and practiced, um, what's it called, uh, charting in the past. It was like, hey, go log into this account, use this email that I made for all of you, and then you can go and do these mock tests. Um, where in this aspect, when you go and do some of these mock tests, you have an option between a couple of different things, such as uh, infection control, uh, radiation health and safety, it's pretty much x-rays, and general chair-side dentistry. So a couple of the common things that we would do chair-side in the office, and kind of for the most part. There's a couple of weirdo questions in there. Usually I tend to skip over them um, if they seem like they're not super like on track like there's just some weird ones in there where it's like uh, medication questions like you're more than likely not going to be asked uh, a medication question as far as like oh what is a high blood pressure medication for junior onset diabetes or something like that we ain't the medical field we ain't that part of the medical field we're the teeth peeps so uh, that's one way that I recommend also giving it a go uh, two. Um, like you mentioned, 88%, I'm pretty sure that that last 12% of that uh, test book that you did, um, you probably understood the answer or why it was wrong. Uh, but if you have any questions on that, uh, if you have any questions on those, if you have any questions about why those questions are wrong, any backstory to them, I might be able to clear those up if you throw them at me. That's I don't know if I have also a because I forgot to I totally forgot to bring home a book also it's, it's dumb on my end 
uh, but there is quite a few different, um, what is it called? Resources that we can go and pick and pull from as far as different questions. Um, I was trying to remember, did, I, I know when you were back here, what was it, like a week ago or something like that, did I end up giving you a printout of a certain, of a different type of test at that time, or were we just kind of, or I, I know I wasn't that much help, the, um, the other M was with you for a good bit there, uh, but having the, uh, I think you were mainly doing the tests out of the book at that time. Uh, you were, you, you here was a couple of those were on the practice. Dude, you here was a couple of, I didn't get a printout. Okay, so that, so that was also one of my like bads and everything. Um, I have your, I have your, our messaging app. I'm gonna send you the document that I use as like a secondary kind of study material too. That might, that may ask a couple questions differently. So stand by, I'm gonna send you that here in a bit. Uh, I have it on me in just a moment. But yeah, I know we were, um, freaking, when you came, what, on Thursday? That ended up being, like, the busiest freaking day. That, that day and the, then the Thursday before, just everyone was trying to get their stuff together to try to finish their patients. It was insane. Like, we were there till... Uh, like four o'clock or something like that just finishing up the final patients of uh, everyone so frustrating but finally thank goodness we're done um also um the test i'm going to send you and everything um, it's one that we've used, it's one that we use within our canvas and everything like that. The version that I kind of took from there, I put the answer key or I put the answers in highlight. So I'm going to send you two versions. One of them that's unhighlighted. Everything's just pretty much the question and stuff, uh, was strong. Oh, super strong. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to send you two versions of the test. One of them is going to be just the questions in the rank regular standard form and the second version is going to have the highlighted answer key in case you want to go and just cross check yourself in case I'm not here and you can always just do that on your own so let me get that um, set up real quick and I'll be able to uh, shoot that over to you okay. Messaging app. And then we can go and get into that next form here. Uh, there you are. Those should be on their way to you uh, in our little chat thing and everything like that. So um, that we can uh, that you can always kind of study as much as you can. Do you have the day off tomorrow? I'm gonna go get Skittles real quick. So one second. I needed those Skittles.
awesome. But in this time frame that I kind of have here and everything, we can kind of do either or. But I'm gonna go into um, I'm gonna go into one of these little sections of this test, and I'm going to kind of answer or do my best to try to get a lot of these right as I can, with a little bit of explanation behind them. Um, what do you think we should do? Or what do you think I should try to take uh, and you can kind of watch along or ask questions along? Infection control, chair side, radiation is going to be, I feel like with the radiation tests, because especially for us, that's not going to be super leaned on as far as here in California. Uh, but infection control and general chair side is going to be where it is at. Which one should I give it a try? It's been a while. So uh, if I fail, don't be making fun of me. Oh no, I'm going blurred. Ooh, I see. Let's see what we can do with I see. Let me go and try to miniaturize my window. Oh, it should not have done that. That's uh, totally not what I wanted it to do. Oh, cool, you have a tomorrow off. Sick. Uh, let me go and transform. Let me fit to screen. Don't want that to do it like that, though. Let's see, do that. I think with that, let's see. All right, so that looks super like, eh, that's for the most part readable. We can make that work, right? It's not too bad. All right, good that you have tomorrow uh, on. Oh, yeah, there it is. All right, OSHA requires the use of a standard precaution for HIV infected or AIDS patients, potentially disease infectious patient, or uh, patients not of record or all patients. Pretty much, oh, that's what you'll do. Oh, it'll work. Oh, cool. So when it comes to OSHA and just saying standard precautions, Hey, we consider everyone that has something that could potentially kill us if we caught it from them. So, there should be all patients. Right. It would be discriminatory to go and select out certain patients and say, you need special precautions. Definitely that should be an all patients deal. And as we get our green check mark, that means, hey, we actually know something a little bit. So, perfect. Uh, oh, I hit submit. Now I'm going to go hit next. Um, which best describes an intermediate level surface disinfectant? So intermediate level surface disinfectant as far as killing certain things, especially when it's in the dental field. Sporicidal, bactericidal, viridicidal, or tuberculocidal. Especially here in the dental field because we we're dealing with people's mouths and all the tubes and air sacs that are connected to it, a lot of times we are just trying to combat um, certain types of germs and specifically when it comes to this yep is the different bacteria that we have to deal with on that one now specifically in dental especially when we go into um, especially when we go into um, uh, when we go into um, the, the mouth and everything and just dental in general a lot of times all of our things are gonna say tuberculocidal agents are present Especially since that's what's found in like capsaicin and um, 
and all the other standard ones. So I want to see if it is. Let's see. I think this is where they're kind of messing with us because it's like, yeah, go and hit those bacterias. Go hit those spherikets, those uh, rods and everything, and uh, cockeyes. But I think specifically what they're trying to aim for right here is tuberculocidal agents because it's a dental-related uh, test in this aspect. And later on, when we actually go and look at um, finish it all, we can come back and look at what answers were that what it's supposed to be, and it actually gives us a little bit of an explanation on why that choice was, why that should be the choice. So that will come a little bit later when we go a little bit deeper in there. We'll probably make um, we'll probably make a pit stop at question 25 and review the wrong the review the ones that we got wrong which is not an appropriate post exposure protocol when it comes to dental specifically remember it's always when it comes to dental an employee may opt for medical evaluation but must assume the cost so this is what is not appropriate so what's the wrong way of handling if someone got poked right uh, the employer provides a copy of the OSHA standard to the healthcare professional. The incident report is filed, and the source's individual test results are given to the exposed healthcare professional. So, in this case, what is wrong out of all of this? A lot of times it's going to be, you got poked on the job, job's paying for your shit. So, definitely when it comes to this, it more than likely should be A in this question. But, let's see what they get to say, right? employee may opt for medical evaluation but must assume the cost that's right because the employer on the job a workman uh, on the job incident on the job pay they're going to pay for that test they should which can kill bacterial spores tuberculosis and viruses when it comes to this specifically we know as dental professionals that there's only one thing that can kill spores uh, um, that can spill that can kill spores specifically exactly C our high-level disinfectant our intermediate level like we mentioned before is our cavicide our optim wipes all that other crap that we can spray or wipe on some places um, low level disinfectant is going to be certain things like Cloroxes and uh, soapy waters and everything like that but high-level disinfectant is perfect um, when they mean high level disinfectant, especially since we don't tend to use that that much, is usually things that we used to use in back in the day called cold sterile. That used to be like this weird little bucket or just like a pretty much like a Tupperware bottle uh, box with a bunch of this blue liquid, which was usually glued to aldehyde um, or a formaldehyde uh, subsect. And from that, uh, you'd leave your instrument or tool in there to get sterilized, sterilized that way because that instrument could not be handle the heat from the autoclave our main killer of spores tuberculosis and especially viruses but spores being the main one ever see spores it's got to be autoclaved or st autoclave sterilized or um or cold sterile sterilized which is usually not even used these much that much these days good stuff which does not mineralize the mount which does not minimize the amount of dental aerosols and spatter generated during treatment. So which one of these is not great at doing its job? Pre-procedural mouth rinses, saliva ejectors, rubber dams, or high volume evacuators. Which does not minimize the amount of dental aerosols and spatter generated during treatment? Well, this would be kind of something that if they didn't really think about, like right off the bat, they would say, oh, well, the saliva ejector does like a terrible job at... Um, suctioning the mouth and such like that well yeah but mouth rinses don't help for anything they just make the mouse the mouth smell fresh and a little bit cleaner but if there's going to be a spray going on then there's going to be spray aerosols and spatter at that point when it comes to level uh when it comes to c which does not minimize the amount of dental aerosols now it's it's kind of odd when it comes to this especially because i've had um people say if you're using a rubber dam then at that point there's no aerosols or splatter generated from the mouth of course with the high speed hand piece or the or the air water syringe um, that's going to create its own amount and everything like that but let's see what we can get with C I believe it should be A but C being a potential choice is going to be the incorrect answer I think mainly because it does not um, it protects the 
the remaining tissue and parts of the mouth from the uh, things. Yeah, exactly. It should be A. Yeah, it should be our mouth rinses because that's only a pre-cleaner, not a reducer of aerosols. Hepatitis B or HBV vaccination must be accepted by the employee, offered free by the empl employer, reported to OSHA within 60 days, or administered annually. Damn hell no, I'm not going to get a shot every single year just for hepatitis B to start off. It ain't like the flu shot or anything. You get your set, you're done. But definitely it should be offered by the, your employer for free. Now, not forever. That's where kind of some of the stipulations be uh, come about because... In, um, in OSHA, as the OSHA standard for this, and this may come up in the test, that your employer has a specific amount of time to offer you the hepatitis B vaccine for free, paid by the office, and if you, ex if you deny it, um, and they write it out as a declination on paper, then they'll keep that in file. They don't have to pay for it anymore, but that should be within 15 days of employment that that should be offered and paid for, but it should be offered by the employer. For free. Good stuff. Which is not an acceptable method of managing surface contaminations. Using a surface bearer, wipe the surface with alcohol, pre-clean and disinfect the surface between patients, and clean and disinfect the surface with EPA registered disinfectant. Okay. Which is not an acceptable method of managing surface contaminations. So when it comes to this, it's going to, yeah, it, this one's going to be because they're offering, be, because we are using surface barriers on damn near everything, lights, handles, the little blue tapes and everything, that usually is in combination with disinfectants and such like that. And you can see everything says disinfectant. It's because of the alcohol specifically. Alcohol dries up way too fast to be able to kill the specific bacteria that are on those surfaces. It needs more time to be able to do its job in that case. So alcohol being a disinfectant for certain contact surfaces is wrong. But a lot of times we tend to use it on our hands in between patients if we're not gonna be doing something deep as far as treatment wise. It can just be like, hey, I'm going to another uh, patient just to do a quick easy exam. I can do some alcohol hand sprays or uh, contactless um, dispensers and that works out just fine. But between patients, uh, it should be disinfectant. Good stuff. Well, we have quite a few people, quite a few people in the uh, over here on YouTube. Also, cool people that want to learn dental, maybe for some reason. Um, packaging instruments prior to sterilization helps minimize instruments rusting and dulling, reduces instrument damage from occurring, maintains instrument sterility after processing, and or prevents organization organizing instruments into functional groups. Packaging instruments prior to sterilization helps with one of these four things. So what could it be? Prevent organization instruments into functional groups. It has that ability to do its thing. Maintains instrument sterility, sterility after processing. Absolutely, you wouldn't unless you're running your instruments uh, for one time use on um, unbagged and everything like that. Once, if once it uh, is left out to be exposed to the air, it's pretty much done. You got to run that again unless it's going straight to the patient's operatory to their mouth. So maintains instrument st uh, sterility after processing. Cha 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 ching. We got that right. Look at you. Hepatitis B vaccine. A hey, the hep is coming back here. Must be. Oh look at what came here. But it's not. They're asking about a days. But it must be offered to which categories of employee? This is where it's going to be tricky, especially when it comes to what the hell category are we considered as far as an employee and such. So this is going to be a little bit of a difficult one where your um, study into the categories as a healthcare professional is going to be a, is going to be tested a little bit more. But um what's it called even on this one like as far as them asking here and uh as, as far as them asking it here um um on your test and everything at least back when i took it so many odd years ago they didn't ask as far as like category but they asked like specifically do we get offered it and do we get offered it for free and how long do we have that opportunity to get it for free and so in that case, so 
uh, dental, uh, dental assistant. Oh no, I want, I want, I do not want to answer, ask it like that. Um, there it is. Uh, Hep B vaccine offered to what category of employees? See, like I'm, like I'm mentioning, it's something that usually is not going to be asked, but the, on this test, they had to have put some t some type of wicked curveball into there, and so even with like some of the things that their category job related tests for something inherit mucous membrane or skin contact with bloody fluids, yeah, essentially it would be us. But I'm thinking that category two also is going to be something within that. No. Let's see. And you know what, what we're going to do is we're going to catch that on the on the come around. Uh we're gonna catch we're gonna catch that one on the come around, and see what their specific answer style is for it to help um, to help us figure out what they got going on there. So that's question nine. Don't worry, we'll be able to catch that. Central nervous system disorders, tremors, and kidney dysfunctions are associated with increased exposure to. Um, look at that. So we are having we're starting to get the shakes, the tremors, and everything. Why would they ask this, especially for people that are in the dental field, on being able to recognize? It's probably because we use something that's dangerous in our field that might cause us to have issues if we're exposed to it for way too long. Exactly. Mercury is the exact one that goes and affects all these different categories here. I remember doing my video on, on that, especially for uh, doing my little uh, mercury amalgam video. Exactly, amalgam. A contaminated dental chart exemplifies which mode of disease transmission. Mad Hatters, exactly, right? So, a contaminated dental chart exemplifies which mode of tra disease transmission. So, the we're handing the chart to the front office or to whoever else comes and gets our chart and we handled it with our gloves and everything. How is someone coming in contact with that with that item at that point. They're not coming in contact with directly the patient's saliva as it was in their mouth or anything. It was usually us that touched the patient, that touched that it, that object that someone indirectly came and grabbed and got in contact with. So exactly. That should fall under our indirect contact limit, which it does, which is awesome. Which is true of latex or vinyl gloves. A glove question. This could potentially come up out there. Gloves may be rewashed between patients and reused until damage. Hell no. Non-sterile gloves are recommended for examinations or non-surgical procedures. Hands should not be washed before gloving. Stupid. Uh, and hands should not be washed between hands should not be washed between patients. Okay, yeah, another wrong one. <laughs> Uh, so non-sterile gloves are recommended for examinations and non-surgical procedures. Yeah, B. And you'll see that in certain situations that when we're out there and everything, even if we do have a surgical procedure like an extraction, no one's reaching out there typically for the sterile surgical gloves. A lot of times we're going to be using the standard ones that we have. But I did used to work with a doctor that would use um, that would use surgical sterile gloves for their extractions only, and I was like, "Oh, that's cool, very specific." But it worked out for them. Which is an example of a regulated medical waste? Used examination gloves, used disposable gowns, used anesthetic needles, or used surgical mask? All of these have have some parts of a human body on them. So, which of them is regulated medical waste? Well, we can see from all of these pieces, three of these items are typical standard pieces that we would wear on ourselves until it potentially got soiled enough that we had to throw it away. 
but anesthetic needles is a very special specific uh, throwaway item that we want to make sure it gets put in a certain area and especially as we are all out there you should be throwing that crap in sharps and you might even have another bucket to throw away the actual vial of anesthetic which is usually going to be a pharmaceutical bucket that's usually I believe it's black in certain cases but it just depends on your office on how you dispose of those Recording the highest temperature reach during sterilization cycle is an example of blank monitoring. We are measuring the temperature that the inside of that, of that steam box gets to. Is it a physical monitor, a chemical monitor, or a biological monitor? They are going to ask things like this, especially as it relates to sterilization, as we are in the infection control quiz at the moment and everything like that. Um, when it comes to us getting our temps of that, uh, of that, um, of the autoclave to the maximum temperature to kill pretend, uh, our main thing, spores, they are looking to how we can actually, um, how hot we can run it and everything. Now, biological monitoring is something that we do do, and that is specifically when we are spore testing. But when we're just trying to hit max temps, that is going to be uh, that's going to be something where and you might not use it uh, uh, you might not use it over at your office so maybe you do but do they have tapes that uh, uh, sterilization or autoclave tape that they may put like a small sliver of it on each package that when it turns when the lines turn brown they know that steam has at least been created I'm not sure if that's what if they have that uh, steri steri tape at your office yeah. And so in those cases, that just at least tells us that this max temperature has been reached, but that does not mean that those instruments are clean. It just means that, hey, we at least hit steam um, in that case. And then biological, the way that we test that is going to be, at that point, going to be our spore test. Um, and physical is, going to, uh, physical is going to be our actual... Um, uh, physical is going to be something else. This should, I believe this should be chemical. We'll come back to this when we hit our 25 and make our roundabout here in a second. I think it should be chemical because on that strip of autoclave tape, that specifically is made to go and turn black or brown once you hit that, mat, uh, that steam temp of uh, 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, a chemical spill victim with immediate symptoms of dizziness, headache, nausea, and vomiting is experiencing chronic chemical toxicity, acute chemical toxicity, chemical resistance, or mild exposure. A chemical spill victim with immediate symptoms. This is definitely going to be one of those acute things. It happened super fast, and it hit, it happened super fast, and it was very, um, very quick, their exposure to it. Versus, of course, the chronic version being way longer than it should have been. The other things right here is just stupid, but that should be our acute chemical toxicity. Yes, they got exposed to this toxicity, which is causing them these symptoms, and then the chemical resistance, well, if this fool was resistant to it, they wouldn't be reacting to it, hopefully. Cool stuff. With that, and, uh, the written exposure control plan must be reviewed and updated. A lot of these things when it comes to an exposure plan usually is going to be reviewed with the whole office annually. Every single year that it should be. Now certain things uh, happen. There might be other different ways that it says this specific question where as far as in an office you should review the uh, exposure plan how often. And one of them is going to be annually another one's going to be um whenever a new product is introduced to the office you may go over that exposure plan and another one might be whenever a new product is added to the office and when a new employee is uh, brought in but that's usually more of a kind of one-on-one -on -one session or um thing that they're going to be doing but in this case especially if you've been there right this is going to be an annual type of situation in that case like we were mentioning, in an office with no new people or anything like that, you're going to review it annually, hopefully. Which disinfectant tends to produce yellow staining? Ooh. Um, I doubt this is going to come up 
in your uh, in your test but this is kind of a weird one uh, which one's going to produce yellow staining? Alcohol, phenol, uh, phenol disinfectants, bleach disinfectant, or iodophore disinfectants? Um, shape with this, a lot of times since we don't usually even play around with like learning these actual chemical based names and everything, we can already tell off the bat, alcohol doesn't stain shit. It does, it's clear, it's not going to uh, stain things, usually it's going to usually make them crack. Same thing with bleach. Bleach is going to usually go and take the color away from things, as we know, bleaching objects and everything like that. Phenols and iodophores, um, that's where it kind of gets a little bit different because those chemicals right there usually need to be aired out when they are used on, um, they usually have to be aired out when they're used on, um, on what's it called? Instruments when we do caracals, uh, when we do um, when we do um, chemical sterilization or chemical autoclave and everything. If we're gonna run with D iodoform and uh, iodophore uh, is going to be correct in that case. When it comes to it, a lot of times, uh, especially brand name, when we talk about um, things, capsides a very notorious um, disinfectant that causes staining on a lot of our objects and everything. So sometimes they say only put it on objects that have resistant coloring. Don't put it on like the metal joints of your, uh, of your, um, of your overhead light and everything like that. But, um, usually when it comes to iodophore or phenols and everything, we tend to stay away from those a little bit more as we go further away or further into um, other chemicals that we can use. Utility gloves are worn. Ah, the, the beautiful utility gloves um, in this case and everything. When are they used? Our dishwasher gloves. Well, more than likely when you're washing the dishes, the instruments and such. So in this case, it's going to be mounting x-rays. No. Disinfecting the treatment room. Yeah. Seating a patient, you probably don't need to. They're going to be worked on in a second. And mixing dental materials, you're going to use your standard gloves. Disinfecting the treatment rooms, but also disinfecting and sterilization, sterilizing instruments over in Steri. So disinfectment of the treatment room is going to be our main one. Now, this is something that we usually, that they have, but as a, uh, as something that you should do. But as you can probably see or tell or experience, not a lot of people whip out the heavy duty gloves to go and wipe down a room, especially in a 17 to 18 knot place. But definitely they're probably underneath the sink, over in sterilization, cracking up because no one's touched them or used them or anything like that in so long. Uh, which protects the gingival tissue during laser bleaching? Ooh, this was a little bit more of an advanced technical question at this point. So at this point, which protects gingival tissue during laser bleaching? Tight-fitting plastic trays, resin-based light curable barriers, cotton rolls or a folded 2x2 two two gauze, or a rubber dam? Protects gingival tissue during laser bleaching. Um, for the most part, when it comes to this, a lot of times this you can consider this... Um, uh, when they talk about laser, they're talking about that stupid blue light, especially, I'm not sure if you guys use like zoom whitening out there, but it's just the blue light that they just go and bring over and just have it pointed at your mouth while you have that bleaching material on there. With it, they use resin-based light curable uh, barrier, essentially kind of like flowable, but they usually make it blue. And people put, and, uh, and the assistants or the dentist puts it on the gum tissue to protect it in case bleach was, to, uh, in case the hydrogen peroxide or carbamide peroxide bleaching material gets onto the gums causing potentially peroxide burn. So in this case, it's going to be resin-based, flowable composite, cur light curable barrier. It should be. If I'm wrong, that sucks. And I'm not wrong uh, because I've had experience doing resin-based things. Um, this tends to be the solid one because with it being um, resin-based and also blue, it helps definitely keep the light, the laser bleaching uh, method, um, laser bleaching um, uh, equipment tool from heating up your gums or being uncomfortable. But awesome stuff. Yeah, we got quite a few people joining in. Some people want to learn about dental, apparently. Uh, welcome, people. If you have any dental questions, you can always just throw it up in the chat. We're here to help. Uh, when using an ultrasonic cleaner, which is correct, which is correct, which, hold on, this is messing me up. When using an ultrasonic cleaner, which is the correct procedure? Which is correct procedure? Yeah, they're just saying it weird. Whatever. Routine clenching takes 
Routine cleaning takes about 60 seconds. Using a basket for loose instruments, hand scrub instruments for placing into the ultrasonic cleaner, or using dishwasher detergents, they are cost effective and efficient. Just that right there at the bottom should already be an automatic just cut to it saying, oh, because they're cheaper and efficient, no one wants to make, no one wants to say that for realsies and everything. Um, but which is correct procedure? Uh, when it comes to this, uh, so we're getting C out of this, hand scrub instruments before placing into the ultrasonic cleaner. It's, it's more than likely when it comes to hand scrubbing instruments, it depends on your state. And that's where it's going to be kind of funky when it comes to that. I believe it's going to be using a basket for loose instruments so that the instruments, for one, don't touch the bottom of the, of the ultrasonic bin because that's where all this, the, the ultrasonic vibrations are emitting from. And so we want them to be kind of lifted more towards the center of the water uh, so that it can have um, ample amount of shakes. It, there you go, it depends on doctor. Doctor wants, hey, make sure that there's no tooth bits from that surgical thing that we did before or else I'm gonna lose it if I see it on there, right? Got it. Oh, you got a story, lay it out for me. Lay that story out, unless you don't want to. If you don't want to go lay, lay it out, just you, you don't have to. <laughs> But let's see. Loose basket for loose instruments. Use a basket for loose instruments. I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a water bottle here real quick. But if you are if you lay something into the chat, I'm here to watch. All right. Hopefully, do is my camera even on? Oh, it is on. Cool. We're working it. But let's go and check on this next question here while anything else is going on. Um, which are not acceptable for use as a surface disinfectant in dentistry specifically? So what can we use to wipe down surfaces? Iodophores, we talked about that earlier as far as a surface disinfectant before. That's our yellowing one. Our chlorine, chlorine based products, our glutaldehydes or our phenols with this. So, I can tell you more than likely for sure you're not going to get a question within this range on that test. It's a little bit deeper than usually they try to ask, but they're just trying to stretch and flex your little brain muscles for this. UB Doc, <laughs> uh, UB Doc is super particular about, uh, about composite and dried stuff on instruments, so he likes us to scrape before ultrasonic. Oh yeah, I can definitely... Uh, see that happening. They're like, oh, I don't want to see anything on that plastic instrument or on that a burnisher or on that condenser Because it, because once it gets put into the cooker into once it gets put into the autoclave that crap is baked on there like damn near permanently Mmm, yeah, I can I can yeah, that was always a um, That was always an annoying thing to find composite on like a plastic instrument after it's been cooked in the autoclave and that it, it it's not impossible to get off but usually I would just use a pair of cotton pliers and I would just go and just grasp onto the instrument and just tear it off and it would come off fairly easy but it's just annoying it's annoying that it does that or that no one went in alcohol wiped it off yeah, it definitely looks sturdy especially if you're using like C4 and it looks like just straight up like a black uh, like you're using like gray clay and it's on there and everything like that it's uh it's something else and even uh and especially since it's on like a composite instrument and everything it's just so hidden too if you're not because a lot of times depending on your instrument it just kind of matches into the metal of it all and everything which is not an acceptable for use as a serpent disinfectant in dentistry. When it comes to surface disinfectant, uh, chlorine based, uh, bleach chlorine based, when it comes to this, for surface disinfectants, yes, we would not use it as that unless we're using specifically chlorine dioxide, which I don't think they're going to be rec recommending uh, for a lot of this. Uh, but all these, glutaldehyde, phenols, and iodophores, we can use those in a diluted in a diluted mix to be able to use on contact surfaces and in our auto and and our chemical claves uh, in this way in this case they're saying chlorine based products so they might be including chlorine dioxide um, 
as far as a disinfectant cleaner. Um, more than likely then if they're not going to do that. Glutaldehyde is a really tough one because it is it has a um, it has fumes to it and especially because with glutaldehyde it takes some stupid amount like 12 hours after it gets used as a after it gets used as a uh, chemiclave chemical uh, that you have to let those instruments air dry so that the fumes are not on there during treatment and everything it's kind of a weird thing but I'm, I'm guessing that one's going to be glutaldehyde when we look at it later. An employee who voluntarily foregoes the hepatitis B vaccine is required to sign a, hey, we talked about this like over back in question two, question three or whatever. So uh, they uh, must sign a waiver stating that the employee will never request the vaccine. Will waiver assuming the cost of the vaccine should the employer change his or her mind. Glutaldehyde is in uh, is in cavicide. It must be th so that at that point, then it's probably it probably won't be that. There's a I remember an incident uh, where someone and I and that's the thing is that it's more than likely diluted and mixed into uh, cavicide to um, to be an acceptable amount. Uh, I had once this employee that used straight. Uh, and as straight as possible, just high concentration, glutaldehyde, not mixed at all. And man, it, glutaldehyde, just like gluma, has a specific smell to it that when I smelt it and this specific assistant used it to wipe down a whole room, the whole office smelled like glutaldehyde and it was just something else. We had to air out everything, send patients home for the day, Get, uh, cancel everyone. It was crazy just to have that whole place air out. So then, I, I always knew at that point that oh, make sure that you don't use that, that or make sure you don't use straight glutaldehyde uh, when it comes to things. But and then, but of course, why did we have it there? Because we didn't mix it ourselves. It was just something that Doc had like off to the side. Unless they were trying to, unless they were trying to sabotage the office like that, that can totally be a big thing too. Um, is he an employee who voluntary? Oh, wait, oh, that's right. This person doesn't want to uh, get that Hep B vaccine. So what did they sign? Uh, informed refusal that is kept on file in the dental office. Informed refusal that is sent to OSHA. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. They keep it in the dental office. That's all they do. Yeah. That's all it is. They don't need to send that to anyone. It's just say, oh, you don't want it? Cool. In case you ever, in case you ever get stuck, poked, or anything like that, we're just gonna have this on record and show it to you when you when it eventually does happen. Um, the OSHA hazardous communication standard requires employers to do all except one of these are wrong. Tell employees about the identity of hazardous chemicals in the workplace. Implement a hazard communication program. Sounds good. Maintain accurate, accurate and thorough MD, uh, MSDS, which is now just called the SDS, the safety data sheet uh, record. Or submit an annual urinalysis results of all employees. <laughs> yeah, please take my piss and send it to OSHA. They they super need that for their evaluations when it comes to when it comes to this all. Please drug test me. Good that good that that's actually a green arrow. I would have been I would have been super suspicious if that was not what I thought it should have been. Good stuff. Uh, the strength of an organism's ability to produce a disease. Oh, this is one of our questions that can come up that you might probably know how to answer. So with this, is it virulence, bio burden, immunity, or infection? Definitely, it is our virulence. That's the uh, that is the strength of a of uh, of an organism, and of course that kind of falls into our chain of infection, our virulence, the strength of the the strength of the bacteria, how much numbers are we coming in contact of that bacteria, is there a susceptible host that is able to contract that bacteria, and is there a portal of entry to be able to get into that host that is susceptible with the amount of numbers of bacteria, and if it's strong enough. So a lot of those things with the whole chain of infection type of deal. Oh, I don't want to hit submit. They hit the wrong button there. Let's go to five. Or let's get to twenty-five, which is not a clinical contact surface. What do we not come in contact with that could? Um, let's read the question. What is not a clinical contact surface? 
uh, unit light handle, so that's our overhead light. Bracket table switch, that's our floating chair uh, arm and everything like that. Operatory wall or air water syringe at that point. So all these are going to be something that we contact when we're interacting with the patient. So definitely the wall is something that we should not touch and they definitely know that from experience, not because you did it, but from something that we were trying to get on everyone is to stop touching the damn wall when they're gonna go and hit the x-ray button. Just push, down that, push that damn button. <laughs> So definitely that's not one of our clinical contact services. We don't need the wall to be put into someone's mouth. Which, of, which is a safety measure for managing, uh, managing non-contact scrap amalgam? Label the scrap amalgam container. Open the scrap amalgam container for ventilation. Please do not do that. <laughs> Discard scrap metal um, amalgam with regulated waste. It needs to be discarded in a specific area, not in regulated waste. Um, place scrap metal in a narrow necked container or label the scrap amalgam container in general. Safety measure. If someone comes into our, if someone comes into our office brand new, doesn't know what certain jar, what's in certain jars, we probably should have jars, boxes, bins, and everything labeled so that they can see, oh, this contains hazardous material. Amalgam scraps only have a certain amount of time open with this container so that we don't uh, risk the whole office getting um, getting the fumes, getting the Mad Hatter shakes and everything. So, awesome. That one was thankfully a think it through easy answer. In which method of sterilization can instruments be processed wet? Dry heat static air, steam autoclave, unsaturated chemical vapors or rapid heat transfer devices in which method of sterilization can instruments be processed wet well we got to kind of think of that through a little bit too if we're processing instruments into our sterilizer or autoclave wet did we just throw them straight into the baggie or straight throw them straight into the pouch wet also and throw them into there so in that case a lot of times because if you do not dry your instruments prior to bagging that could t can potentially cause them to rust uh through their whole process of course it's like well we're turning the water into steam how could that cause an issue um when it comes to it but through all these and everything like that it is their steam autoclave the autoclave is going to heat up everything in there to become vapor steam and that should follow the same process of what we're doing here we still don't do it throw those instruments in bone dry so that we don't risk um getting uh getting extra rust in it and everything aren't they wet after the ultrasonic yeah they're yeah exactly they're wet after the ultrasonic but like after you yeah exactly the same after ultrasonic rinse it in the rinse it out in the basket inside the sink pop it over to the pop it over to the uh, packaging area and they should be pat dried so that's as much as we should have it um, when it comes to um, when it comes to pre packaging the instruments just at least pat dry uh, when it comes to it but processed wet I don't know what the how wet how wet is it how wet are they asking so that's where it kind of comes to like do they need to air dry out before we go put them in or not? Uh, oops, we we don't do that. Shut your mouth. Shut up, Ben. <laughs> you mean <laughs> stupid? Um, which action is necessary when the outside of a biohazard bag becomes contaminated? Process it through the steam autoclave. Disinfect the outside surfaces, place it in a regular trash bag, or place it inside another biohazard bag. A bag within a bag, a taco within a taco, within a Taco Bell, within a KFC. Yeah, it's more likely going to be the contamination bag got contaminated, put it in another contaminate, put it inside another contamination bag. More than likely, this should be what it is um, when it comes to that. Don't throw it in a regular trash bag. It's going to be unthought of that it's not contaminated anymore uh let's see with this let me see that everything's doing well actually that i want to have some background music totally forgot that we have background and we still have five peeps in here so that's cool welcome all of you if you are really here and not just like bots or anything like that welcome to the dental show
Hopefully we can uh, keep you entertained uh, through this whole adventure. Uh, the most important infection control law in dentistry is OSHA's blank. Creepers. Yeah, that's right. These people are just straight creeping on me and you talking about dental things. And that's cool. We enjoy the peep show. Uh, the most important infection control law in dentistry is OSHA's fall protection standard, respiratory protection standard, bloodborne pathogen standard, or hazardous communication standard. Usually if it's going to be in OSHA, and especially since we are working inside people's bodies, more than likely we want to make sure that the standard that we follow is going to be on the bloodborne path so that we don't contract HIV, AIDS, hepatitis size, your B's, your C's, and everything like that. So don't like this question because a lot of times right and especially when it comes to this they're probably going to say oh what about the hazard communication standard also but i believe especially with this being osha and everything should be our bloodborne path which it is thankfully uh but i mean fall protection standard sounds like fun i want to read up on that one respiratory protection standard wear a respirator or wear something that helps your breathing definitely well, let's see protective eyewear should have extra thick lenses tinted lenses that seems pretty cool side shields or spring-loaded ear rests i want a spring-loaded ear rest that sounds tight especially if it takes that pressure off my ears that'd be cool but in these cases extra thick lenses um, yeah exactly it should be our side shields that go right over here extra thick lenses sounds cool but unless we're working in like a sheet metal shop or a place where our disc like uh, trimmers are going to break off and try to stab us in the eye we probably don't need those extra thick lenses tinted is just for being cool though side shields is where it's at the high volume evacuator aka hve removes saliva and liquid slowly removes large amounts of liquids and debris from the mouth Dispenses a focused stream of air, well, not dispenses, but sucks in, or dispenses a condensed stream of compressed water. Oh, yeah, this one should be, if anyone's ever touched dental at all, super obvious. It removes large amounts of fluid debris from the mouth. Usually, our HPE is used during times such as if a doctor is adding water actively to the mouth while removing tooth decay or anything or prepping a tooth usually you're gonna want the HVE to remove it from the mouth as fast as they are putting it in there. So good, removes large amounts of fluid and debris from the mouth. Which container requires a chemical label? A disinfectant bo spray bottle, a ultrasonic cleaner tank, a x-ray processing tank, or all of thy above? Well, all of these potentially can, ha they can harvest, or see, I pointed up, I know it's probably down there, but all of these have chemicals or can have a chemical put in them. They all got dangers. More than likely for these that requires a chemical label is gonna be all. It should be, and it is, because the x-ray processing tank is gonna have a fixer and developer. The ultrasonic cleaner tank is gonna have an enzymatic cleaner. Disinfectant spray bottle is gonna have really gnarly disinfectant sprays that we don't need to touch. So, good stuff. Gloves are required to handle each item, except one. Which is this exception? Preliminary impressions, final impressions, laboratory cases, or laboratory prescriptions. If you're going to be touching crap without gloves, make sure that you're touching something that's not been in someone's mouth. All these three, all the top three have been in someone's mouth at one time or the other. The lab script or the laboratory prescription is the one that you're going to hopefully touch without gloves. Please don't touch it with gloves, because then it comes to me. And I'm touching that, I'm touching that thing, usually gloveless a lot of times. OSHA inspections may occur randomly in an office with two or more dentists, 75 or more patients, five or more operatories, 11 or more employees. This one's throwing me off.
I know, that's what I'm thinking is B. Like, you're, you're an operation that's getting off the ground. You're more than likely frequently having patients around enough to be able to be visited, which doesn't seem right, but I think it is 75 or more patients. Nope, something else weird. Random, if you have five or more operators. Yeah, OSHA's about workers when it, yeah, OSHA's about workers when it comes to it, so 11 or more employees, if we're kind of looking at, at that route and everything, unless they're going to be like, hey, you have too many doctors, you guys can conspire against these poor workers, or five or more operatories, plenty of places have usually about four, but any anything that's worth salt is going to have more than five, so I don't think it's that. I'm sure it's the employee's bit. We'll check that out. We'll check that out in not too long. I wanna, I wanna read up on that one in a bit too. Uh, which agency requires employees to provide a hepatitis? Damn, they are. So oh, we're in their infection control one, so they're always gonna be on about uh, hepatitis B. I got Skittles on D. <laughs> Don't worry, I got my Skittles too. I got a wild berry plus tropical mix in here. Sometimes I get a good one. Sometimes I don't. So. <laughs> Uh, which agency requires employers to provide the hepatitis B immunization, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Food and Drug Administration, Environmental Protection Agency? Craps OSHA. Yeah. Occupational Safety and ha uh, Health Administration. They've been, they've been talking about this the whole time. Which agency regulations apply to handling of waste in the dental office? OSHA. EPA, CDC, or the FDA. Now, specifically, you have to look at that keyword, waste. And waste, where is it going to be uh, disposed at? Usually uh, outside of our office and such like that. So if the waste that we produce or make has to go out of our office into the trash can or into medical uh, or into biohazard or into anything like that, you're gonna uh, the EPA is going to be looking at our at our waste buckets to make sure that we aren't throwing away things that shouldn't be thrown away. As an example, throwing away human teeth inside the regular garbage, big ol' no-no. Disposing of sharps needles in the regular garbage, hell no. <laughs> yep, the Environmental Protection Agency. They will watch you with a big ol' magnifying glass. How often should spore tests of sterilizers be executed? First thing every morning, once every week, after a high-risk patient, hey, that's discrimination, or if the sterilizer has been turned off for over 24 hours. The hell? Yeah, this one's gonna be once a week. I always wanna go and te spore test your things weekly. Especially if you have multiple, especially if you have multiple autoclaves running. When recapping a needle, the dental assistant must not use a one-handed scoop method, mechanical device designed for holding the needle for recapping, Disposable syringe with a sheathing uh, with a sliding sheath or a two-handed scoop method uh, So two-handed scoop method They should just say two-handed method, but definitely that's the wrong one Because I don't know how you're gonna scoop with two hands unless you're gonna use both hands to hold on to the device and scoop it from there that still would work, but two-hand cap method is definitely the wrong one when it comes to that. Which has, which has have the highest operating temperature and longest cycle time? Dry heat sterilizers, steam autoclaves, or unsaturated chemical vapor sterilizers? Highest operating temperature and longest cycle time. With this, I believe when it comes to this, it's going to be C. That's what I believe, but... Yeah, I think this is gonna be C in this case. Unsaturated chemical vapors, steriliz uh, sterilizers. If it's not C, it's B. So it's gonna be regular steam autoclaves. So what, because regular chemicals boil points are much lower so that they vaporize quicker and have a short cycle time a lot of times we don't tend to be a, especially in dentistry we don't use chemical sterilizers like near at all anymore 
Uh, that's kind of an old school method that we are just using specifically. I say it's old school in dentistry. They still use it in medical and uh, in, uh, uh, in medical fields and everything like that. Uh, but in auto, uh, in dental, we typically just use steam autoclaves. And that other one that we have there, dry heat sterilizers, that's like a bead sterilizer. Those that does that shit doesn't fly here. Um, next one, which which error will not result in a failure of sterilization? Which error will not result in a failure of sterilization? Improper loading, inadequate timing, faulty seal on the chamber door, or failure to use a processing indicator? Which error will not result in a failure of sterilization? Failure to use a process indicator. Not result. D. This, this, this double negative BS is, is throwing me off. That's that's what's happening here when it comes to it. Um, yeah, if you load it improperly, you're going to fail. Inadequate time, your instruments aren't going to be sterile. Faulty seal on the chamber door, your gasket's all stupid. You're going to have an air link and you're not going to pressurize. So yeah, don't use a process indicator. That's Your process indicator is the, is the autoclave tape. So, if, yeah, if you don't use that, it's, it still can be fine, if, as long as the, as the process completed. The goal of an infection control program is to prevent disease transmission from the patient to the staff, the staff to the patient, patient to patient, all of the above. The goal of an infection control program is to prevent disease transmission from, well, we don't want anyone to get infected by anyone, especially us, but it should be a all of the above. Unless they're gonna go do, to go do a trick question on us, good. Yeah, we don't want anyone getting infected. We're gonna hit this and stop this at 50, and we're gonna look over the ones that we kind of got wrong. Which agent is most lethal? Sporicidal, uh, sporicidal bactericidal, verticidal, uh, verculicidal, or tuberculicidal? Which agent is most lethal? Well, all of these are cidals, which means it is to kill something. Um, most lethal? Yeah, A. Because spores are so damn difficult to kill without it being a sterilized, like, autoclave, to kill spores with something that's super strong should be a very tough thing to do. Which it is. Good stuff on us. How often are chemical monitors used in, ster in the sterilization process? With every instrument pack? With, with one pack per load, daily or weekly. How often are chemical monitors used in a sterilization process? Uh, a chemical monitor is usually like this little, and I'm not sure if you guys use it over at your place, um, but it's this little vial that you put in the autoclave and you pretty much test it just like you would do with a, um, with a spore strip. But once you go and run that chemical, uh, that chemical monitor in the, ster in the autoclave, you then go and put it in an incubator, and then you match it to this this grid. It's kind of like testing your pH in your pool. And then if you're if it passes, you'll know that within like uh, three, I think it's 12 or 24 hours, you'll know the results. If everything in there died, it doesn't change a color or it does change a color. So that's what that is. And so I believe in that same aspect, it's usually weekly. Um, in that case, unless they're going to do it daily, we never did it at our place. We always did, uh, we always did, uh, spore tests. So how often are chemical monitors used? We're going to see that in seven questions to know what they expect it to be. But if they're, if they're not saying chemical monitors in that case, because then that vial would be different, but... Yeah, we'll see what that comes out to be later on. Not too long, I should say. Protective clothing is not required for charting because the risk of exposure is low. Okay. Must prevent mucous membrane exposure to blood and other bodily fluids. Must prevent mucous membrane exposure to blood and other bodily fluids. Okay, so it protects us. Uh, can be worn home to be laundered. No. We should be washing it at, it should be washed or disposed of at the office. Is also known as underclothing. No. No. So this is going to be, uh, must prevent mucous membranes exposure to blood and other fluids. Just like, even it says, oh, we're just charting for the dock. It's not high contact or anything like that. No, we want to protect us at all times. 
uh, with our PPE, protective, personal protective equipment. After removing the plastic surface cover from the clinical contact surface, so this is what we were talking about earlier, that we can use barrier tape or barrier sleeves, but even if we use it, we got after we pull it off, we still got to wipe everything down underneath. Um, clean and disinfect with an intermediate level disinfectant and place a new cover. A, it's kind of along the process that we're thinking. Clean and disinfect with a low level disinfectant and then add a new cover. Oh, low level? No. Uh, clean and disinfect with a high level disinfectant and recover. We're not going to use high level disinfectants here. Uh, and, or place a new plastic cover as long as the underlying surface remains untouched. We would wish that that would happen, but because we don't trust even the protective tapes and sleeves, we are more likely going to clean, disinfect with intermediate, and new cover it. What in the world? What do you mean? How? Do you even know? Mm. Okay, we're going to come back and see what their version or thinking uh, as far as uh, that is later on. I think that should be incorrect. Um, heavy utility gloves are used for all... I doubt they would use... I doubt that they would require you to use low level, but that's probably along the same... That's probably along the line of thinking that they're probably traveling. But we'll see. We'll see in about four questions here in a second. Heavy utility gloves are used for all internal procedures, for radiographic processing when entering data on the computer, please don't, or to work in the con with contaminated instruments. So this is kind of the utility gloves that we were talking about earlier that like no one tends to use. Those are gonna be contaminated instruments over in sterilization. Heavy duty or heavy utility gloves. It's alongside of using them to clean the operatories, which also no one like does out there. So contaminated instruments uh, which best describes the purpose of holding pre-soaking instruments prior to cleaning uh, which best describes the purpose of holding or pre-soaking instruments prior to cleaning uh, kills microorganisms reduces water spotting makes cleaning easier minimizes rusting well if you're leaving crap dipped in water for too long it's gonna start rust the rusting process makes cleaning easier is the main piece so that it's just just like how if anyone's ever made lasagna you don't want that lasagna or whatever you bake to go and harden up against the walls of your pan. Same thing. You don't want your dental materials like composite or like bone uh, from surgery or tooth bits to harden up on your tools. So this should make cleaning easier because the holding solution isn't anything special. It's just enzymatic cleaner. It shouldn't kill microorganisms as much as I believe it shouldn't. So, making cleaning easier so that things don't harden. Which qualifies as a biological monitor? Spore testing, process indicator, process integrator, or gauge reading? In this case, if it's biological, that means it's a material that's a living and we want to kill it in our autoclave. And so at this point, that would be a spore. And specifically, since we do spore testing weekly, that's going to be it. Because we're going to be trying to kill the, what is it called? Geobacillus stephalomophilus. I think that's what the spore is called inside those spore tests for biological monitoring. Uh, disease, disease is transmitted through which means? Disease is transmitted through which means? Sleep deprivation? Yeah, sure, I, I contracted something because I didn't sleep enough. Uh, physical exhaustion? Same, kind of along that same line. Person-to-person -person contact or damp or cold weather? I don't know if they're just trying to throw a softball at us or something, but it should be person-to-person -person contact. Yeah. Last one before we hit it. Uh, before uh, Last one before we go and check the wrong ones that we ended up getting. Uh, cleaning instruments prior to sterilization, kind of talked about that a little bit ago, increases the chance of sterilizer success, reduces the instrument's rusting and doling, kills any microorganisms present, or minimizes instrument damage. Hmm. Increases chances of sterilizer success. We don't have extra bits on the, on the, on the equipment. It should pass through things. I shouldn't say even with the word pass, but good good we hit 50 good job let's go and end our exam 
and it's going to give us a list of things that we got correct and incorrect and it keeps on saying hey we didn't answer some questions that's what I like about this little thing so let's go see those uh, pieces that we did which best describes an intermediate level surface disinfectant which I can just go ahead and review we got answer one right and like I mentioned before it lets us know what's happening underneath as far as why the answer is right and so let's go to the ones that we muffed up on which best describes an intermediate level surface disinfectant and so in this case we answered bactericidal but it should be tuberculocidal kind of what I was mentioning because we are dental field we want to be able to have that tuberculocidal agent in a lot of the things that we use so we don't contract it as easy uh, let's go over to our next one that we end up getting wrong. Yep, we, we already talked about this one earlier. Um, the mouth rinses don't do anything for us as far as keeping aerosols down. Hepatitis B. So when we chose this, yeah, you, like you mentioned before, category 1 and category 2 as far as uh, employees for hepatitis B. When it comes to that, which includes us. Yeah, I read that wrong. Hey, you're you're good. But like it says with feedback down here, OSHA mandates that HPV vaccine be provided for Category 1 and 2 employees. Category 3 employees are not exposed to blood or saliva. Good for them. Um, when it comes to the next one, oh, no, we already got this one right. Uh, cool. Biological, but should have been physical. Physical monitoring involves examination, monitoring, observing, and recording sterilizer activity. Oh, so essentially when it comes to the physical monitoring at that point, because they're saying that we're recording that it reached its high temperature, that's going to be, some autoclaves have printers built into them, and with those printers, you can have it print out every single sing, every single uh, cycle that it ends up doing its, uh, uh, that it ends up completing, or, un, or incompleting, depending on what situation that you're in. Uh, so I guess that's what they mean by, oh, just either chart that it completed and it was successful and then log it into this autoclave log which not a lot of places tend to do usually we just log in the successes from the weekly biological monitoring that we tend to do let's go over to our next one uh, which are not acceptable for the use of surface disinfectants in, dentist in dentistry uh, we chose at that time chlorine based products like I was mentioning before, chlorine dioxide is one of those that are used in dentistry in a way. But they don't like us to use glutaldehydes. Glutaldehydes are unacceptable surface, def uh, surface disinfectants due to high toxicity and tendency to discolor and corrode surfaces. So like I mentioned before, um, with that one uh, assistant that went and wiped things down with straight glutaldehyde, Super dangerous, especially because of the, the especially because of the fumes that just inhabited the office and everything. Uh, so with that, that's where that's where my previous history came down to. And especially since if we do have if we do have glutaldehyde inside of our capsaicin wipes, it's very very minimized and also diluted with a bunch of other stuff. But good that we know that glutaldehyde is something. Uh, and we tend to use glutaldehyde also in other things. It's a very common thing in one that we call gluma. Uh, that's a desensitizer that's used on teeth to make them not as sensitive after fillings are placed. The next one that we go to. We had a good hot streak of right answers going on this one. Next one. Oh, this is one that we wanted to talk about, which was our OSHA standard. And like you mentioned before when we were going through this, that's right, OSHA is specifically looking after the safety of the employees. And in this case, they are mentioning that OSHA inspections may occur randomly in an office with 11 or more employees. OSHA dental inspector inspections also occur at the request of the dentist or when an employee or patient files a complaint. And I tell you, there's a lot of people that try to get back at their offices by filing complaints and trying to get OSHA to visit, uh, visit a certain spot. And there might be good reasons that they do especially because that person worked there and they knew what was happening on the inside it's good to get them to get it's good to get that place uh, run through the ringer sometimes the next one that we uh, we got one oh recently you you had a inspection let's see on this next one that we have which has the highest operating temperatures and longest cycle? 
uh, dry heat sterilizers. Why would there be a dry heat sterilizer that we would use in the field and everything? Oh, that's... Um, inspections are very exciting, I would imagine. Hopefully, I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys are very high up their uh, facility, so I'm sure you guys did very well at that. Hopefully. Hmm. Uh, dry heat sterilizer. Dry heat sterilizer requires 60 to 120 minutes of processing at temperatures of 320 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius. Uh, steam autoclave operate out temperatures of 250 to 273 degrees Fahrenheit for 3 to 30 minutes. Chemical vapor sterilization requires a processing temperature of 270 for 20 minutes to 40 minutes. So dry heat sterilizers, I doubt we are using that because that's like using like a hot bead sterilizer, which is also not used these days. So that's an odd one. Uh, but whatevs, kind of gains up. Yeah, we overachieved on the inspection. Patient complained though. Oh, was that what was that one of the things that prompted it? Then, which also kind of sucks, but eh, it happens sometimes, right? Patient complained though. <laughs> oh, that blows. But yeah, I mean, that was also another one is that either patients can go and make one of these happen as well as like uh, prior employees and such. How often or how often are chemical monitors used in a sterilization process with every instrument pack? You brought this one up earlier as, as potentially A, which was right. Um, when every uh, feedback appropriate monitoring as recommended by the CDC involves the use of a chemical indicator on the inside and outside if internal indicators cannot be seen of each pack, pouch, or cassette when it comes to it. With this uh, chemical sterilizer, that is the autoclave tape at that point, so that the chemical that stays there as white when it gets hit with steam turns black or brown, sharp color it is. Uh, um, after removing the plastic surface cover from oh this is one that perplexed me right after removing the plastic surface cover from the clinical contact surface they are saying to place a new cover plastic cover as long as the underlying surface remains bullshit complete nonsense no this is the no no way I understand that that does make sense but no one would let no one would let anyone slide pulling that crap off careful <laughs> correct answer or feedback carefully removing the protective cover without touching the underlying surface prevents the surface contamination and negates the need of pre-cleaning and disinfecting between patients absolutely not we know that we understand that the different things that we use, such as protective covers, pierce super easy. So that one's, uh, yeah, exactly. Wipe it down afterwards. I mean, you already wiped down everything else in the room. It's, and that might be just coming, that might just come down to it just being of habit of, oh, we already have the wipe at hand. Just eat. Just go and wipe it down and then you're good. Even if it is untouched. Or maybe it just kind of goes into the fact that it's really hard to not touch the under surface of a protected um, equipment piece. So, whatever. That, that, that frustrated me. And then we hit all the way to 50. And we did good. Not too bad. Not too bad. And especially since this is specifically hitting certain uh especially with this um with this version of the test and everything being able to focus on infection control or focus on radio or focus on general chair side i like this never know if someone spatters uh, while removing uh the barrier yeah exactly it's uh it's uh it's wacky it is wacky to wacky but not too bad when we came to it that's uh that was pretty good I would say golf clap, golf clap, right? You, you did very well, Ben. I know that you're going to do great on that test. I expect... Do you have my number? Do you have my number? Why don't I have... Why don't you have my number at this point? 
I think, because you have M's number. I never gave my number? All right. Uh, you can check your chat uh, that I sent you those, uh, that I sent you those, uh, that worksheet through also. And then, um, so you'll have, I don't know why I never gave it to you. Let's see. Uh, okay, everything's safe there. Uh, but you go and you let us know. Let us know when uh, when the results hit you. I'll just say it like that at that point, um, so that um, so that it can be exciting. So it can be cool because uh, it'll be you. It'll be that other assistant. Hopefully, I can get three people in a row in this upcoming week uh, passing their test. That would be, uh, is it instant? Yes, in a way. Um, at least when I had uh, someone come in recently to talk to us, I was like, hey, did it give you like, or do you have to wait for, uh, wait for days? Back when I took my test and everything, I had to wait till the freaking snail mail sent me my results and told me I passed. So that took like two to three weeks when I first took it. Of course, that was like 10 years ago. Um, but with these ones, with, especially since it's all written, te uh, written exam on the computer and everything, once you hit enter and finish that, it might take a little bit, but it's either one of two things. Either it tells you that you passed on the screen or when you walk outside of that room and you tell the person I finished my test, they tell you your results right then and there. So it's really no processing time. It's a freaking computer that knows that you're supposed to get 75% or more, or it's 70 or 75% um, of the questions right, and then it just gives you the results right bam there. They're not trying to grade essay questions because there ain't none of that. It's all multiple choice, so. Uh, you'll you'll know you'll know before walking out of that building, so that's gonna be pretty sick when that happens. Um, I had my um, the student that I was talking to about that was saying that um, when they hit enter on their computer to submit their answers, that the computer errored out on them, and it didn't give them like a like a you're finished please leave the facility message and so when they walked out and talked to the person that is standing there at the that's at the desk they're like oh yeah we're just waiting for your results from your computer and then once they came which was like maybe like a minute or so later then they're able to be like hey this is what happened good job thumbs up and uh I think when they took it, it was like 6 o'clock at night. I think that's when their test was scheduled. So she, so they, she sent us the message super late. I passed. Woo. Which was super cool. We were excited. We're always excited when, uh, when, we, get a new, when we get a new one of yous joining our field. But it is... Um, it's nerve-wracking. I can see that. Mine's late. Is it like a 6 o'clock late like the other person had? I think when I took my written exam, I took them in the morning. I took them both in the morning. It was like 8 o'clock in the morning for both my law and ethics exam and then separately for my infection control exam. And then, of course, my stupid practical hands-on test was at like... I could imagine it was 7.45, 8.30 in the morning. But I had to drive all the way over to San Francisco, so I left at like 3 o'clock to drive to San Francisco, to be there in the parking lot, to wait, to take my exam, and that was just a rough morning. That, that, that was just a rough day, but pff, I passed the first try. Who would have thunk it? I, I was super surprised to pass my hands on practical my first time. Actually, all those tests I passed the first time, but I guess when you hold off on taking the test for five years... You really don't have an excuse to, that much of an excuse to mess up after your hands have been trained that much to do hands-on stuff. I thought it would, I thought it would have uh, screwed up on the paper test quicker. So don't be like me. For some reason I hated money. 
I didn't want to get my RDA for five years after I uh, was a dental assistant. Earned that, earned that cash. I definitely should have done it earlier at that point. I don't know why I didn't. I've got an excuse. I'm taking it right out the gate. You are, you're right. You're probably, especially in your aspect, because you only got your your acceptance letter like, what, two weeks ago or something like that? Not even two weeks ago? You were pretty much like, got it, log in that number, what's the earliest thing, schedule it, bam. <laughs> so that's a... That's going to be good. You're probably even in a better situation because you're, you've retained a lot of this, a lot of this uh, schooling and everything. Yeah, I made the appointment that same day, right? So that is pretty good. Uh, let me be right back one second. One moment. Yep. Good stuff, man. Let's see. I want to give it, uh, and if you're going to be here, cool, but I kind of want to give this other one a go, which is going to be general chair side. I know that one's got to probably be a little weird also on their end. But let's see. I was trying to keep my testing on the DL, but Denise had to bring it up in the. St uh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that, yeah. Well, it's going to be even more brought up if if it does, if you end up passing and everything. Not everyone knows I'm testing. Yeah, and that's the thing that sucks because then if, right, if it doesn't go the way that we hope, it's going to be, um, be kind of sucky to explain, but don't worry. It, it, it should go well, hopefully. Unless they, unless they try to make an example of you, then it's like, pff, whatever then. Um, let's try this one. Uh, the assistance operating zone with a right-handed operator. So our standard one, added pressure for sure. Oh, definitely, right? The assistance operating zone with a right-handed operator is, in our clock system of working with the patient and the doctor, is 2 to 4 o'clock, 12 to 2 o'clock, 10 to 12 o'clock, 8 to 10 o'clock. In this case, with the right-handed dentist being uh, to the right side of our patient, which means that he's occupying everything from like about six to 12, uh, we would more likely be that two to four. And it seems like we have a short range of movement when it comes to that, but that's the most one that, op that gives us room on our side, even though it's just our body being at two to four, but our hand reach is everywhere to make it all work in, the, in, that, uh, in that situation. CAB, more like the CPR, is a basic life support that stands for care, access, and breathe. Circulation, airway, breathing. Chest compressions, airway, and breathing. Or call 911, airway, then breathe. We do have a small area. We, yeah, technically, right? Uh, and definitely in this, and this always changes because it's always like, what's the ABCs of CPR? Or what's the ACAP? Or what's uh, scene safety... Uh, consciousness patient, uh, check the check the pulse, check the airway, all that BS. It is yeah, exactly. Circulation, airway, breathing. When it comes to this, what uh, what in the world is happening here? We'll be back on that. Yeah, I was like chest compressions, airway, breathing. Did we already establish that the patient needs to have CPR? Because unless they're uh, not pulsing up right and everything, I'm not going to start pumping like it, there's no tomorrow. So check your stuff. And that's where it comes to some of these having a little bit more of an older style of like, oh, we assume that you should have started CPR in this uh, at this point. So weird, yeah. 
Uh, which procedure is not performed to remove bony defects or restore normal bony contour? So this comes down to our different types of um, medical names and words and everything. So osteosurgery, osteoplasty, osteoectomy, or gingivoplasty. So between the two things that we're seeing, ectomies, plasties or surgery if it's ever going to be a uh, oh, let's see, which is not performed to remove bony defects or restore normal bony contour so restore normal bony contour means that they are going to plasticize or reshape it so at that point it's not going to be a plasty at that uh, in that case osteoectomy which procedure is not performed to remove bony defects or restore bony contour Osteectomy. If you're ever doing an ectomy at that point, you are doing a complete removal of something at that point. Osteosurgery is just doing surgery on the bones. Uh, in this case, I'm guessing that they're going to go into, which is not performed to remove bony defects or restore normal bony contour. In this case, they're going to say gingivoplasty because with gingivo, we're specifically dealing with the gums. Everything else is mentioning osseo, osseous, that's bone. So gingivoplasty. Good. Which agent is prescribed to reduce patient's fear and tension? This is the osseous bone, exactly. This is the BS that I'm talking about and where this one's being a little bit more easier on it, but you'll have some weird questions that are going to go into the actual drug name, generic and everything, about what what works well with that. Which agent is prescribed to reduce patients' fears and tensions? An analgesic, an anti-anxiety, a hypnotic, or an antibiotic? Analgesic is going to control pain. Hypnotic is going to be a little bit of a funny one when it comes to that. Antibiotic is for infection to prevent or to uh, remedy. And anti-anxiety should be for our fears and our tension. It should be B. Ask me what actual medication is for it. Don't even ask. I, I have no clue for the different versions of out there that docs prescribe to our patients. Uh, next one, a 10-year-old patient would likely have which mixed dentition? Ooh, this one seems fun, especially with all these words. A 10-year-old patient would have which would likely have which mixed dentition? So a set of doc. That's doc's job. Yeah. Why are you trying to ask me if I if I'm going to diagnose something, right? <laughs> uh, or, or with the with the drugs and everything. Yeah, that's doc's job. But permanent mandibular centrals. So permanent lower front teeth, lateral incisors, primary second molars, primary second molars and permanent mandibular canines and purse and permanent first molars. Okay. We at least know this person's above the age of six years old, but not 12 years old yet in this case. Permanent mandibular centrals and laterals, permanent first and second premolars, this per and permanent and primary second molars, permanent first molars, primary second molars, Permanent first and second. Th this one can't work because our premolars that our perm our premolars replace our primary or our kids molars. So this one doesn't make sense at all unless they have that shark tooth style where one tooth is right next to the other, growing into the arch. So that's wrong. Primary mandibular centrals. Okay, this one's wrong because we lose our kids' teeth primary uh, by the age of six, seven, eight. So this can't be it right off the bat. Permanent mandibular canines, primary centrals and laterals, that's completely out of order because our canines come in at uh, 9 to 11 years old and we can't have the primary centrals and laterals because those would get lost at 7, 8, 9. So this has got to be the first one. It should be. Thank God I know what I'm talking about, even though it seems like I, I drag on everything, but cool. Which instrument is used to remove debris or granulation tissue from a surgical site? You got this, Ben. What is it going to be? What do they use to remove debris or granulation tissue from a surgical site? Essentially, when they're saying debris, they're talking about like uh, bony bits or even like abscesses from a surge site. If you got it, you let me know. Is it a rangier forcep? A surgical curette? A periodontal probe or periosteal elevator. A 
Good job, our surgical curate. Bow, bow, bow. That is our version of a spoon excavator that we use in our surgical sets. Say larger spoon, uh, larger spoon excavator. Performing an expanded function that is not allowed under the Dental Practice Act is punishable as a criminal act, permissible with the dentist's authorization and direct supervision, acceptable if allowed in another state with reciprocity, or considered an unintentional tort of omission. So we're doing something that we're not allowed to. More likely you're breaking a law, which is also going to be within that, uh, within that whole... Um, uh, within that whole criminal act area considered as an unintentional tort of omission if it's unintentional tort like you didn't mean to harm someone then why are you doing it <laughs> so yeah punishable as a criminal act good uh, which generally have two, which tooth generally has two roots? Maxillary first molars, mandibular first molars, maxillary second premolars, maxillary central incisors. Okay. It should be B. Now, it is B. Here's the trick question, too. Because this shit is annoying also. Shirts and pants. You are right. Thank you for bringing up shirts and pants and the whole concept behind that. If they would have said maxillary first premolar, which is 5 and 12. Maxillary first premolars has a chance to have a bifurcation, a small little root de deviation at the tip of 5 and 12. That can happen. But they're not mentioning 5 or 12. They're mentioning the second one, 4 and 13. So this is our mandibular first molar. Good stuff. Easy peasy. That's the standard look of a tooth that everyone knows it by. That would be a rude question. <laughs> it would definitely be what is called a rude question. Each is included in the service record when new equipment is purchased except... Date of purchase, model and serial numbers, warranty, expiration date, name of person responsible for preventative maintenance, which is included in the service record when new equipment is purchased at that point. Date of purchase, model and serial number, warranty, expiration date. It should be D. Name of person responsible for preventative maintenance. Yeah. B, model and serial Whenever we purchase new equipment, we heavily... We were definitely going to take down the model serial number, um, specifically because it's usually going to be something that matches up with the warranty card and everything, so that we know that they're not like that we're not trying to jip them on repairing everything. But the name of the person responsible for preventative, for preventative maintenance usually, of course, is going to be Doc or the office that uh, that um, that buys it and everything. But usually because that name can change throughout the lifespan of that piece of equipment, um, they don't tend to follow certain things like that. Unless it's like unless it's like digitally tracked like a lot of things are these days. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It's weird. If, if, and the, when it says of new equipment, because it is brand new, if it was, if it was, uh, Older equipment that just got reserviced, and we need a label of who worked on that piece of equipment. That's a little difference. Definitely, that is going to be the maintenance technician that worked on this is responsible for it. But just saying like, oh, this person's going to be responsible is a little bit of a different act that they're kind of saying. But weird, right? Definitely weird. A genetic, abnorm uh, genetic abnormality in which there are defects in an enamel formation. This is someone just trying to say, seem smart. A genetic abnormality in which there are defects in enamel formation is germination, fusion, ankylosis, or ameliogenesis imperfecta. Uh, so the enamel is not forming right. We've learned this before when it comes to this. 
Uh, germination is where uh, a another tooth starts growing from that same one. Fusion is where instead of it growing from the same one, two of them fuse together. Ankylosis is where the um, the root cements or binds to the bone of the surrounding uh, jawbone. And ameliogenesis imperfecta. Read it backwards. Imperfect genesis uh, growth of amelio. The um, the the cells that create enamel. Yep, so Ameliogenesis Perfecta is what it's going to be. Coolio. Next one, which is not a component of the clinical record? The clinical chart, health history, medical history, or recall card? Which is not a component of the clinical record? Medical history, health history, clinical chart, recall card. In this case, it should be our recall card. In this case, I believe it should be a recall card. Everything else pertains to the patient specifically. Yeah, recall card. A right-handed dentist doing a preparation on 30 mesial occlusal, as if it was a filling, the dental assistant places the high volume evacuator, HVE tip, on the buckle of 30, buckle of 19, lingual of 30, occlusal of 31. A right-handed dentist so that's me over here doing a prep on number 30, which is on their side when they're doing that filling. We are going to go and put our HVE tip on the lingual of 30 or the occlusal of 31. If you pop that sucker on 31, you're going to get in the way a little bit. Even though the doctor's only doing it on the mesial aspect of it, if you put yourself over there on the lingual, you might be too close. This seems like doctor's preference on wherever they want you to sit at. But let's rock it as lingual of 30. Unless it's... <laughs> it's a, you mean like, unless it's the one that's like, no, I got it. Don't worry. Don't try to protect the tongue. I got it. You're doing too much. And all of a sudden you start seeing red in the mouth. <laughs> yep, if the doc doesn't know what they're doing and they don't allow us to do our job, people are getting uh, patients are going to get hurt. Let's get some more uh, skittles. All right, a fixed bridge can be completed in how many appointments? One appointment, dose appointments, tres appointments, or cuatro appointments. In this case, usually if we are going to be doing a prep of any kind, when we're going to be making a crown or a bridge for someone, usually there's going to be the appointment to, for one, prepare the tooth, and then there's going to be an appointment that they come back to cement the new crown or bridge uh, for that person. Unless these days, like you probably have experience, uh, CEREC or same day crowns is instilled into the office. Um, but a fixed bridge appointment can be completed in two sets. The prep, the bring back patient to cement date. Yep, B. A periodontal pocket marker appears similar in design to thumb forceps, cotton pliers, a Gracie scaler, or a periodontal probe. Yep, no set crowns yet, especially in the bridge aspect. Unless it's like a couple unless it's like a three unit bridge for like a couple anteriors for a very short short person a periodontal pocket marker appears similar in design to thumb forceps cotton pliers a gracie scaler or a periodontal probe yeah exactly bridges right One second. All right, we're good. It's being haunted up in this, apparently. I swear. All right, uh, with a period pocket marker, it. This is the weird one. This is the weird one. I'll, I'll tell you that. Because a perio pocket marker, it looks like uh, cotton pliers. It's a cotton plier that's like, it's like a regular cotton plier on one side. And on the other side, it has this little 
Uh, on the other side, it has this spike that when you go and actually clamp it together, it leaves pierce marks in the gum tissue. Watch, uh, periodontal pocket marker. It looks like a cotton plier with that little spike in there. And we'll see it here in a second. Where's that dumbass look that it has? This probably looks like it pretty well. I'm going to kind of not look at it a little bit in depth. Yeah, that little spike that's right there, that little spike on the on the tip. It look it, it it's very weird. We have a bunch at the at the lab. Uh, but I don't really whip them out because it's main, because mainly when it comes to that tool, it's a um, it's something that Perio uses a lot and we don't really teach you guys about periodont uh, periodontal offices because mostly our only function as an assistant at those offices is mainly our regular chair side assisting and um, and the periodontal um, what's it called the perio pack thing that we do uh, that we can make in place and everything so there's not that much that we can do in perio but it looks like cotton pliers it should be it should be the right answer good it is uh, in which notation are the permanent teeth numbered from 1 to 32? Oh man, this is a super hard question. Is it the universal te the universal system, the Palmer system, the Federation Dentier Internationale, or is it the bracketing system? Uh, bracket numbering and everything. Yeah, 1 to 32, that's universal. Only in America. Right? A for America, right? <laughs> Buffer time in the office schedule is reserved. Oh, this is front our office garbage, which I'm terrible at front office uh, lingo and garbage like that. So, <laughs> give give me time. Uh, buffer time is in uh, office schedule is reserved for emergency patients, school children, staff meeting, the lunch hour. What the hell's a lunch hour? We get lunch. It's not that. Staff meetings? Probably it's staff meetings. They usually would just put, uh, we usually would just call that blocked out time. But whatever. <laughs> we're, well, I don't know where the hell they're uh, putting that one at. Cross contamination between components of a two paste composite system. So this is also super old school because. No one mixes composite paste anymore, an A and a B, a base and a catalyst, uh, to make composite. It's all out of the freaking syringe or uh, twisty or it's all in that gun system. But uh, cross-contamination between the components of the two paste composite system causes the material to harden, prevents the material from hardening, that's stupid, uh, diminishes the translucency, dumb, delays the polymerization. If you're accidentally mixing a little bit of, of jar A with jar B, whatever jar A comes in contact with in that other jar is going to start to harden on you. So that should cause the material to start hardening. Might not be the whole jar, but when you go back in there to reach for another scoop of something, you're going to feel hard pieces. Which gypsum product is commonly used to make a diagnostic model? Which gypsum product is used to commonly make, a, make diagnostic models? So study models. Uh, plaster, dental stone, high strength stone, impression plaster. Um, D is a is a weird question because impression plaster is a type one stone that we don't use anymore. It used to be like taking an impression with plaster, and that's very 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 old school. No one ever does that these days. We have way better things to take impressions with. Um, when it comes to making diagnostic models or study models, usually you can use the weakest type of material that's out there, which is going to be plaster. Um, dental stone is going to be used if we are going to go and process different appliances on it. Um, and high strength stone is going to be used for, as an invest, uh, as another type of stone if we're going to be making like crowns or if we're going to use like, pre um, if we're going to be using uh, pressure um to like process like dentures so that the high strength stone doesn't crack under pressure for us so this should be plaster yeah plaster is the right answer cool 
which ingredient uh but does it really matter uh, okay does it really matter not not too often it doesn't like like i'm not sure do you guys pour up your, i'm pretty sure you guys pour up some models in office what do you guys use do you guys use plaster or do you guys use yellowstone in your cases Bluestone. Okay, essentially, yeah, stone in general. Uh, it just has a uh, blue. T it just has a uh, blue coloring to it, so that it just comes out blue. Um, but still within that, I believe it's called Type Three, which is investment stone. Uh, that's good. The nice thing about all of these things is that they have pros and cons to it. Of course, the pros and cons that we've like taught you guys is hey, you just need more water or you need less water, but when it comes to certain things like this, especially when it comes to stone, um, there is, you get high strength, which is awesome. You get good high strength when it comes to pouring up in stone. Uh, but I believe, if I can remember the graph right, is that with stone, it's high strength, but high expansion, if I think that's the right one. So during the process of it hardening and everything, it might have a little bit of expansion that it does, um, especially if you're not mixing it right, especially if you're just kind of eyeballing it, like we all do out there in the field. Uh, if you high eyeball it and everything, it might expand just a little bit more than it should or than it needs to. Uh, plaster is, is very weak as far as a study model material. Um, but I think it, its expansion rate is much lower, but that's a bad thing because if it's, if its expansion rate is low, that means it's super accurate, but it's weak. Um, you can't really process or do a lot of things on it, but you can study it and take like your measurements because of its low expansion rate. Uh, and then as you go further up to, uh, your other expand, uh, to your, um, uh, to your type 4 modified uh, hemihydrate uh, stones and everything like that. Uh, those are super high strength, but they also, if I believe right, have the similar expansion rate as stone does. So it's useful, but it has some bad qualities to it too, in a way, and also requires less water. Um, does it really matter? Not too much. Uh, the only person that it matters to is the dental laboratory that makes your crowns because they are going to pour that sucker up into they're going to pour that sucker up in um in high strength investment stone so that's all it really matters is if something's being made onto it but now these days people are just printing out models these days after y'all scan it so a bunch of other things with that too Next one question: Which ingredient is a lo uh, which ingredient in local anesthetic solution prolongs the effect of the anesthetic? Isotro uh, isotron isotonic solution, reducing agent, vasoconstrictor, or, or preservative? Uh, in this case, like we've taught you all, when it comes to the actions of our anesthetic, it is prolonged and made uh, uh, vasoconstrictors help reduce constrict the vein so it can't carry away the anesthetic into your bloodstream and because of that constriction of the veins uh, in that area where the injection happens it allows the anesthetic to last longer so it is going to be a vasoconstrictor which usually is inside of the epinephrine that's in our anesthetics so it should be a vasoconstrictor which it is Surgical retraction is a procedure referred to as cold steel surgery, electrosurgery, electrolysis, or gingivectomy. Surgical retraction is a procedure referred to as cold steel surgery, electrosurgery, electrolysis, or gingival gingivectomy. Well, if we're doing an ectomy of anything, we're removing it. So if we're removing gum tissue, gingiva, um, then that's not going to be a retraction type of deal. 
Uh, electrosurgery also burns or cauterizes the areas. I'm not sure if I would call that a retraction, though. But you, because they're, they're saying it as a different version here. They're saying that we're not trying to pull back tissue that we are going to put back in place. They are pulling back tissue that's either overgrown or is, uh, needs to be pulled back to do like a crown lengthening on. So I think with surgical retraction, they're probably going to be on B or the answer is probably going to be B. Let's try A in this instance and see what we get from there. Cold steel surgery. I want to kind of know what's going on. I think it's electrosurgery where they use like a, um, a, a, a dental laser, either a laser handpiece or whatever they're using, or, or they're using some type of cauterizing, uh, or they're using some type of hot knife uh, situation. One second, let me go and get the dog out. Let's, Next one, what do we have here? A patient presents with a fractured amalgam restoration, so their metal fillings cracked. But time, but time in the schedule does not permit placement of the permanent restoration. Electro, electro electricity <laughs> uh, does not permit placement of a permanent restoration. Which cement mixture will be required? Doesn't sound right. Um, temporary cement to a secondary consistency. Final cement to a secondary consistency. Temporary cement to a primary consistency, final cement to a primary consistency. So primary consistency is going to be smooth. It's going to be the way that we cement things. So definitely it's not going to be anything primary. Secondary being the more firmer, uh, doughy stage that we can use some of these uh, some of these things in. But they don't prevent. But they're not. We don't have enough time in the schedule for a permanent restoration. But at a later date, they will need to get that permanent restoration still done. So in that case, because we don't want to use a final cement on the tooth, because we're going to remove it eventually, or I should say temp uh, at, at that point, we can go and mix a temporary cement to a secondary consistency that will give us our doughy stage and our malleability, our formability. And so let's see if our temporary cement as a secondary consistency is correct, which thankfully it is. Um, usually our final cements would be things like our glass ionomers, our polycarboxylates, our, uh, our uh, glass ionomers or Fuji, polycarboxylates or Duralon, uh, zinc phosphates is another one that we can use or we don't tend to use a lot anyways. Uh, but our temporary cements would be our IRM. That's all they're asking is just mix IRM to a dough form and then pack that sucker. Especially as an assistant, that's what they want to know. Who's allowed to do this? Necrotic tissue is removed from the lining. Oh, we got a new, we got a first person over here in Twitch chat. Hello. Uh, I'm gonna call you Oz. Sorry, that's not what we want to go by, but um, welcome. We're just talking about dental things and everything, and we're kind of going through one of these tests and doing uh, study time for a exam, but. Stick around, ask questions. Definitely, we can always talk. What are your thoughts about magnesium chloride? Magnesium chloride. Uh, as far as it being used in dentistry, as uh, is all that I'm kind of assuming in this case here. Let me uh, let me see. Let me get a little thing. Okay, I see what you got going on here. Are we using it specifically then, if we're using magnesium chloride as a treatment option for gingiva or for, um, for gingivitis and stuff like that, is this more of a, is this more of a holistic approach to um, to this as an alternative to um, as an alternative to 
getting actual like treatment or is this an additional thing that's added to your treatment plan of getting like a uh, a deep cleaning done Ah, don't worry, I'm back. In regards to calculus, let's. Well, actually, I like this. I kind of like this discussion as far as uh, as far as a question in regards to calculus. Does it sh has it shown promise to uh, has it shown promise to um, to break down the calculus uh, to break down calculus at that point? Then I'm doing. I'm looking at a couple of studies as far as this, uh, as far as this and everything like that. In my time out in the field as a dental assistant, gotta start off right there. I am a dental assistant, been in the field for about 15 years or so. Um, in my offices that I've been to, we've never used magnesium chloride as an additional aid to break down or help with the breakdown of dental materials like calculus and everything. Uh, but it sounds interesting as I'm doing a couple little little uh, doing a little bit of hopscotch research on this. Um, I'm looking at a lot of studies on how they're doing it, or uh, of it. A few papers from Japan. Yeah, I'm looking at a couple things. Not many studies out there. I'm wondering, which I which I like about it is that it's still kind of brand. I don't want to say brand new, but I like that there has been. Um, deeper dives into using other things out there for helpful situations like this. I'm kind of rocking through some of the subjects, but the chemistry is there. Yeah, exactly, right? And that's where we have to have this testing to be able to see is, is, if it's suitable for um, long term for, um, I would say human test subjects, but for getting good results here. Nurse carries uh, nice patient system of hyperplasia. Da, 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 da. Results gel. It's for the right spots. Hmm. This is interesting. High efficacy. Especially in early stages, I like. Okay, I like. I like. The, I like the. I like the actions of what this is able to do. Then. That's a magnesium density gene. Density gene. Density gene. Hopefully, it didn't. Reconnection successful. Okay, I might be back on. I might. For some reason, everything disconnected for a moment there. This one's talking about calcium hydroxide specific or calcium hydroxide. There we go. Uh, you have to come at it from the angle of chemistry, though. But that, uh, well, well, that's that's the nice part. Of that that's the interesting. Ba oh, perfect! It says I'm back. But that's the interesting part when the, in the makeup of the calculus. That, that that's the part where it comes to it is uh, coming from from the angle of chemistry as like, this should work. The breakdown of everything and all the different, uh, the binders and everything, it should work when it comes to it being applied specifically to this material. How does it run when it's, uh, when it's, in, when it's exposed to actual uh, other human uh, tissues and such for prolonged periods or for however long that they are administering this for? And... Um, also, which I know that I'm seeing a couple of these studies and how they're mentioning these, um, and how they're mentioning their, um, their, um, what's it called? I want to say study groups, but their tests and everything like that. I want to know how their application, which it's a lot of text to go through, but I want to know what their application style was. For these people, but I'm gonna keep this up. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep looking at this. It seems really cool. Shoot, if you can. If we can get that figured out, and if we can, if we can get that figured out and actually uh, cement, cemented, uh, pushed through our community, there's not a lot out there. That that's the fun part. And also, like we're mentioning, if there's not that much out there, what, um, 
what country is going to allow or look down on future studies of this. I was seeing that when they were kind of I, I was seeing that when they were talking about um when I was seeing that when I was reading over one of these very slightly, just jumping around, um, the development of uh the development of teeth and everything, um when they were bringing up that in, in certain cases where they were having uh, dentino genesis imperfecta in that case that uh, in early signs of that this could help remedy uh, this could not help remedy completely but help in the formation of teeth and that kind of like an aspect like we're trying like we're always trying to get with systemic fluoride um, in the early years and such so that's a super Super cool studies. I like that. And whether you come from, uh, whether you are a dentist or you're coming from a dental background or you're in your dental studies or you're in your dental years or you're just a chemistry person, um, super cool to have smarties around here. I mean, I don't consider myself uh, anything special, but the whole the whole area of science and this aspect of looking at it uh, from areas of unknown is super cool. To dive it, decide deep, to dive deeper into and such. So, thank you for bringing that up, uh, bringing that to my attention. Love it. Let's see. There's a tea that's been used for kidney stones in some cultures. That's where a lot of it. That's where a lot of it tends to come from. Is that what did the what did our ancestors use in their times of or what what that what was in their diet that allowed us to have to combat certain things that we are not we are no longer ingesting these days that we are getting like you're mentioning in kid uh uh, uh for kidney stones and everything. Chaka Pitara tea. Because there's a lot of tea that's been used for kidney stones in some cultures, and kidney stones are made of stones, right? Uh, change of pretty tea. Oh, okay. I kind of like that. I am going to take. I'm. I'm just adding like tabs to my. Uh, to my uh, list of. My list of uh, things that I have on my phone to be able to read while I got nothing else to do during another time so this is super interesting uh we both understand that kidney stones aren't stone right exactly in in the in the way in the aspect that hopefully a lot of our a lot of people that end up getting them should hopefully have an understanding of what it's uh what it's uh makeup is Chemical that release of the behavior. Yeah. Well, I got that. I got this rabbit hole to dive down through now, which is going to be neat. And then the other one that I wanted to do was this one here. That is going to be. I remember there was one instance which was a really, really weird one that I had a dentist uh, tell a patient at one time that the patient was not um, was not in the mindset that they wanted to get a deep cleaning happening to remove all the calculus and everything like that. So the doc, I don't know why they recommended it like this, but they just did. Uh, they were just like, oh, well, to help soften up and uh, to help soften up and break down the areas that are that we can clinically see that have calculus on it, just use lemon juice, straight lemon juice on the calculus surfaces to help with the breakdown of it. And the guy took that information, and I have no clue what ended up happening to him, but that was uh, an odd thing to hear from them. Heard people use white vinegar and lemon? Big, right, exactly. When they were going and doing certain things like that, especially when they go into um, like super, super holistic homemade type of stuff. It's like, 
maybe don't do that. Maybe kind of do a little bit of research on, on who recommended that or don't listen to TikToks as much that may recommend certain things like that. Because, um... Don't trust everything you read on the internet sometimes or listen to or get exposed to, especially during these short form videos of people. But I mean, it's 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 that whole community of of oil pulling people and such like that. Yes, there are benefits to certain aspects of it, but there, it comes down to the misinformation of people seeing like, oh, oil pulling. Uh, will doubt will reverse cavities and rebuild enamel uh, rebuild dentin in enamel it's like there's benefits to it but it's not a miracle cure it's not a it's not a panacea that was going to cure all and everything it doesn't mess with cavities but it also messes with exactly the acidity of the lemons and everything and the vinegar vinegar is going to mess with your uh, with your enamel and it's gonna it's gonna mess them up in a different way it's gonna be too harsh you're gonna get massive erosion to the teeth at that point, and uh, that's a whole different type of the spectrum that you don't want to be on uh, in that in that case, right? And yeah, oil pulling won't fill exactly, and and that's where the that's where the information comes from. You'll see everyone just that's gonna be like their their thumbnail of their video is like oh reverse cavities by doing this simple 15 minute routine every single day it's like no BS don't don't believe in that it's not gonna fill a hole the hole can only be cleaned out and refilled with some with a with a suitable substitute that's been tried and true but yeah exactly that that's uh, that's that comes to the whole reason why we are in this and why we have why I like having this channel um, for these certain situations is to be able to talk to people then get them to realize that it's not that easy to just do it all on your own especially but I love the conversation thank you for bringing this up and everything uh, or thank you for coming and, uh, and conversing with me um, it is kind of late in my uh, neck of the woods so I am going to be calling it a night but um, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's nice having you around. Yeah, you take care too. Ben, if you are still here, thank you. Uh, ben, if you are still here, um, like I'm, uh, like we were kind of going over here. Ginger, gingerbread cottage, stupid. <laughs> you were like, I have this ready for it. Let me check it out. Gingerbread cottage. There we go. What was it? Necrotic tissues removed from the lining of the periodontal pocket. Yeah, cottage is going to be cutting out the dead, the the bad tissue. Gingerbread. Mesio, uh, mesio occlusal buckle restoration is abbreviated in the uh, progress notes or chart as MOB. And the second soft tapping sound of the heart produce, uh, produces is the systolic reading, the, peristat uh, the peristatic reading, diastolic reading, vascular reading at that point. And that's where we're going to pretty much call it the second soft tapping sound. When it comes to CPR, especially in what's going to be coming up in the dental uh, in the dental aspect of our um, exams, they're not going to ask you this when it comes. They're not going to ask you this when it comes to it. Um, they're going to ask, "Oh, what of the vital readings are we able to take in a dental office?" And they'll give you just a readout, or like which one of these is not a reading that we would take. But apart from that, let me go and hit up uh, classroom. Cool, we got somewhere. Uh, we have uh, we have a pretty good. You got you you got you got it pretty much down. You you got it pretty much down at this point. I think you're gonna do just fine on it. You have my number and everything like that. Let us know as soon as you have it. Uh, you got it going on. Make sure to gloat and rub it in their faces. Call it. You got it wrong. Yeah, you got it work. I guess I do have to work in the morning, don't I? Sometimes I forget, right? Or sometimes I want to forget. <laughs> but maybe one day this will be this will be it. I'll just be the one of the only online live tutors that we can uh, get going in the future. But uh, apart from that, you let us know. You let us know. Do your studying. Keep on doing it and everything. Um, but we will hear from you tomorrow. Take it easy.